Okay. <laughs> I think we're going to kick off all the recordings with that now. It won't necessarily be Father, but someone will say, James, we're starting at the beginning of each. <laughs> I had just pushed it, so that's the that's our open that's our cold open now. <laughs> our cold open is James, we're starting. Uh, and when when we start here in a minute after my non introduction introduction, uh, we're gonna be starting with Psalm uh, eighty three, Orthodox Study Bible eighty four otherwise. Okay, but the non-introduction introduction is, once again, if you want to hear my introduction to the Psalms, I did it twice on the first two, uh, first two recordings, which are available on the website. If you're listening to this, you obviously know where that is, since I'm talking <laughs> to the recorder. Uh, and you could, hear, you could hear that either place, that introduction. Um, and otherwise, we're just going to start so we could try to get through as many Psalms as possible <laughs> per evening. Okay, so Psalm, were there any questions anybody had or anything left over from last time? Okay. So Psalm 83, Orthodox Study Bible, 84 otherwise. How beloved are your dwellings, O Lord of hosts. My soul longs and faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh greatly rejoice in the living God. For even the sparrow found a house for herself, and the turtle dove a nest for herself where she will lay her young. Your altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. Blessed are those who dwell in your house. They shall praise you unto ages of ages. Blessed is the man whose help is from you, O Lord. He purposed a sense in his heart in the valley of weeping into the place he appointed. For there the lawgiver shall give blessings. They shall go from strength to strength. The God of gods shall be seen in Zion. O Lord God of hosts, hear my prayer. Give ear, O God of Jacob. O God, our protector, behold and look upon the face of your anointed. For one day in your courts is better than a thousand. I chose to be an outcast in the house of my God rather than to dwell in the tents of sinners. For the Lord God loves mercy and truth. He will give grace and glory. The Lord's hand will not remove good things from those who walk in innocence. The Lord of hosts, blessed is the man who hopes in you. So this is the central focus of what this psalm is talking about is the fact that in the house of the Lord, and at this time it seems to be referring to the temple when it was originally written, but that was Lord in general, there's a place for everybody. And the example that's given is, it's talking about these birds. He's making a reference to the fact that as with any, as with any building, once it's built, right, birds will make nests, right, in the, in the eaves and around the roof of the building. So he's saying, look, even these birds, you know, have a home here in the temple of the Lord, meaning even me too. Right? And that's what he's getting at when he talks about I chose to be an outcast in the courts of the Lord rather than to be <laughs> welcomed among sinners. This is, this is the contrast. In order to come into God's house, in order to really come before God, we have to accept the fact that we're sinners. Right? We have to repent. Okay? And so, on the surface, the two options well, I could go here to the house of God and be seen as a sinner. Or I could go out here in the world and everyone will say how great I am. <laughs> right? And I could have a good time and not worry about it. On the surface, a lot of people would go for, well, hey, I'm going to go dwell in the tents with the sinners. Right? <laughs> They're having a good time. They don't judge anybody. <laughs> right? you know? That'll be great. Right? The tents of the <laughs> Well, no. That's, but so the, uh, the point here being better, better in the long run, right? The man is really blessed who comes into the house of the Lord, even though to do that requires requires admitting our sinfulness. Okay, so Psalm eighty-four. Oh, sure. Why did they use? Saints, then verse, I think it's four, I can see it right there. And they plotted against your saints as opposed to the word prophet or people. Wait, verse four of this psalm? Oh, you're talking back at 82? Yeah, Psalm 82. From last time? 83 or 84. 
82. Yeah. Yeah, that, yeah, that's the last one we did last time. Um, well, what it literally says is your holy ones. Your holy ones. Which, depending on context, is either a reference to, is sometimes a reference to angelic beings, is sometimes a reference to righteous men. The saints is like sort of a modern terminology. Right. Well, saint... Saint, the English saint just relies, or comes from the Latin sanctus, which means holy. So it means the same thing. It's just derived through the. So you're holy men. Through the Latin. You're right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. okay, so now Psalm 84, Orthodox Study Bible, 85 otherwise. O Lord, you were pleased with your land. You turned back the captivity of Jacob. You forgave the transgressions of your people. You covered all their sins. You ended all your wrath. You turned from the wrath of your anger. Turn us, O God, of our salvation, and turn away your anger from us. Will you be angry with us forever, or will you prolong your anger from generation to generation? O God, you will turn and give us life, and your people will be glad in you. Show us your mercy, O Lord, and grant us your salvation. I will hear what the Lord God will speak in me, for he will speak peace to his people and to his holy ones, and to those who turn their heart to him. His salvation is very close at hand to those who fear him, that glory may dwell in our land. Mercy and truth met together, righteousness and peace kissed each other. Truth arose from the earth, and righteousness looked down from heaven. For the Lord will give goodness, and our land shall yield its fruit. Righteousness shall go before him, and establish his footsteps as our pathway. What's interesting in this psalm is the way it keeps changing tenses. <laughs> right? It starts out and it's past tense. Right? Lord, you were pleased with your land. You turned back the captivity of Jacob. Right? You forgave the transgressions of you people. You covered all your sins. You ended all your wrath. And then in verse 5, turn us, O God, of our salvation and turn away your anger from us. <laughs> it's sort of... <laughs> right? Right? Why? <laughs> well, the idea here is that. <laughs> well, the, in, in this case, not all those things actually happened in the past. Like, all their sins were not covered in the past. That's why they ended up in exile. Right? And so, you know, it says, verse 4, you turned away from the wrath of your anger. Verse 5, turn away your anger. <laughs> it's asking him to do exactly what it says he did. Part of this is the, the way the tense system works in Hebrew and Aramaic is different than the way our tense system works. In English, our tenses are all based on time. Right? So we have past tense, right? He went, <laughs> right? Present tense, I go or I am going, right? Future tense, I will go. Tomorrow. That's how our tense system works. The tense system in Hebrew and Aramaic doesn't work that way. The tense system in, in Hebrew and Aramaic is all about levels of certainty, right? So there's one tense that's I might go, <laughs> right? And then there's another tense that's I will certainly go. <laughs> and another tense that's, you know, I probably won't go. <laughs> it's doubtful that I will go. Right? And so it's a different, it's a different way of, of expression. So, if I were to go, so it's based what? on, say that again, it's based on what? On certain? On, on, on the certainty of whether the action took place. So uh, you could, you could, at the time, there is no time element. So the same word could mean I might go tomorrow or he might have gone yesterday. <laughs> based, on, based on whether it says tomorrow or yesterday after the verb. <laughs> right? But it's, it's based on how sure we are. Okay? It's based on how sure we are. Right? And then there's like if, there's conditional, say if, I do this, 
then this well, that's like will saying, surely happen, or that this might happen, or that this. That's saying like if a frog had wings, <laughs> it could fly. Yeah, he would his butt. But, but, I, yeah. So, I, I, so what's being translated as past tense here at the beginning? Okay. And I'm trying not to go into all the technical terms of tenses okay, well, in I'm Greek kidding. either. <laughs> but, Simple version. What's being translated as past tense here at the beginning? is translated as past tense because in the original what it's saying is this is for certain going to happen. Okay. okay. And so because it's for certain going to happen, right, it's like it already happened. Right? So there's proof that it actually happened. Right. So it's not, it's not God might do this. Right? It's God will do this. And so then when they're asking, they're saying, we know God will do this. Do it now. So they're asking him right. to step in now. Right. Right. God, we know that you are going to cover the sins of your people. We know you will not be angry with us forever. Please come now and forgive your people and restore us and restore us. Well, why didn't they just say that? <laughs> <laughs> well, they, they did. They wanted to frustrate you. And, and they did. They <laughs> did, but then it got translated at least three times. <laughs> so. <laughs> okay. And so it becomes less clear after the third translation. <laughs> that's exactly what they were shooting at. But that's what they're shooting at. They're saying, God is going to do this. It's like when we pray, we know that Christ is going to return. Right, but you look at the, the the epistle reading we had today at the end of it. St. Paul says, "Lord Jesus, come quickly." Mm-hmm. Right, we pray that He would come soon. Yeah, come soon. now. You're wanting to come now. That's, That's it. God, we we for. know the kind of God you are. We know you will not be angry with us forever. We know you will forgive the sins of your people. Come and forgive us now. I'm glad you explained that. I've never figured that. Out. <laughs> so that's that's what's going on there. Okay. And so, so it's, it's, it's an expression at the beginning of confidence, right? And the same is true when we get to the end. After verse, in verse 10, his salvation is very close at hand to those who fear him, right? Meaning we know it's near. We know it's coming. But then in verse 11, <coughs> it goes back into the past tense. Mercy and truth met together. Truth arose from the earth. That's that same thing. That's, we know that mercy and truth are going to be together. And the truth arose from the earth. Remember what Jesus tells Pilate. Pilate says to Jesus, what is truth? Right? That's his big question. Jesus says in John, I am the way and the truth in life, right? So this is right. Truth arose from the earth, and righteousness looked down from heaven, right? For the Lord will give goodness. So this is this is saying this is the salvation that's near at hand, and that when right. truth arises, that would be Jesus, right? Okay, right. So that's, that's what the, this song is. Psalm 84 is about this confidence that God's salvation is near at hand and it's coming. Right? And wanting it to come, to come quickly. So Psalm 85, Orthodox Study Bible 86 otherwise. Incline your ear, O Lord, and hear me, for I am poor and needy. Guard my soul, for I am holy, O my God. Save your servant who hopes in you. Have mercy on me, O Lord, for all the day long I will cry to you. Gladden the soul of your servant, O Lord, for to you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. For you, O Lord, are kind and good and very merciful to all who call upon you. Give ear, O Lord, to my prayer and heed the voice of my supplication. In the day of my affliction I cry to you, for you heard me. There is none like you among the gods, O Lord, and there are no works like your works. All the Gentiles you made shall come and worship before you, O Lord, and they shall glorify your name. For you are great, doing wonders. You alone are the great God. Lead me in your way, O Lord, and I will walk in your truth. Glad my heart so as to fear your name. 
I will give thanks to you, O Lord my God, with my whole heart, and I shall glorify your name forever. For great is your mercy to me, and you rescued my soul from the lowest Hades. O God, lawless men rose up against me, and a gathering of strong men sought my soul, and they did not set you before them. But you, O Lord, are compassionate and merciful, long-suffering and very merciful and truthful. Look upon me and have mercy. Give your strength to your servant and save the son of your handmaid. Work a sign in my midst for good and let those who hate me see it and be disgraced. For you, O Lord, help and help me and comfort in me. Okay, so this, the first thing with this psalm is, who is the I, right? Who is the person who's saying this psalm? And there are a lot of really good clues here at the end. It's at the beginning of the prayer by David. Right, David wrote it, right? But if you take a look, for example, verse 14, O God, lawless men rose up against me, and a gathering of strong men sought my soul. Right? That's, that's one of those images we've seen in several psalms now, of the people all plotting against, plotting against someone. Verse 13, you, rescu- you rescued my soul from the lowest Hades. The Hades there really is showing the grave. You rescued my soul from the grave. And then note, especially in verse 16, the end of verse 16, give your strength to your servant and save the son of your handmaid. Right? So, the person, and that servant occurs several times. When you get to the book of Isaiah next year, toward the end of next year, probably, but next year, um, that is going to become important because Isaiah and his prophecies is going to keep talking about this servant of God who's going to come and who's going to suffer. Okay, And this is the same image that's used here in this psalm. Is this person is the servant. But notice, it's your servant and the son of your handmaid. Right? <laughs> handmaid being female ser- servant. Would that be Mary? That would be Mary. The hand right. Who, when Gabriel comes and uh, right, when Gabriel comes to announce Christ, going to be going, behold the handmaiden of the Lord. Right. So, the son of the Lord's handmaid. <laughs> this gets picked up. So it's Jesus. This is this is coming from Jesus. Jesus is right. The one who says, "Guard my soul, for I am holy." Oh my God, save your servant who hopes in you. Right. But a couple, a couple more points here. One, building off that, again, we see a part where Mary shows up again. Right? Where it's significant. She's significant. Right? Often, our Protestant brothers and sisters will say, well, there's not all that much about her in the Bible. Well, there's, as we're seeing as we go through, there's a lot more than you might think. <laughs> She's mentioned a lot more than right. people say. Right, and, and it's not, so, so the fact that it's not just God's servant, but God's servant, the son of his handmaid, right? She's important here too in this picture that this psalm is giving us. The other point, and this is something we've seen in several psalms too, is that the key to what happens when the Messiah comes, what's the next thing that's going to happen? Verse 9, All the Gentiles you made shall come and worship before you, O Lord, and they shall glorify your name. Right? See that yet again. This is, this is the picture. And this is the picture that the Jews of Jesus' time had. Right? The picture is the Messiah is going to come, right? And then the Gentiles are going to be converted to the worship of, of our God, right? And so, St. Paul, right, once he, once he becomes a Christian, once he sees Christ on the road to Damascus, right, he realizes Jesus is the Messiah. So what does he, being a good rabbi who's read the Old Testament, <laughs> right, and studied it thoroughly, what does he think? So what happens now? Well, now somebody has to go tell the Gentiles about <laughs> about our God, right? And so, what does he do? He goes out and <laughs> starts doing it. Not just this wasn't just a whim that struck him. Hey, shouldn't we share this with the the Romans and the Greeks, right? <laughs> that wasn't just a whim that struck him. This is 
you know, hey, if the Messiah has come, <laughs> it's time to go bring in the, the Gentiles to worship our God. So this is, I mean, this is just built into the Old Testament here. It's not something... It, it, a lot of times, you get presented the New Testament as if sort of the Old Testament was going one way and then all of a sudden Jesus shows up and, yeah. you know, it, it goes off on this detour. But I hope we're seeing... So we're going through the Old Testament. That's not really the case. The Old Testament is going this way and Jesus comes along and... <laughs> It keeps going the same way, right? He fulfills, so it means that he fulfills what's going on in the Old Testament. Okay, so Psalm 86, or the next study Bible, 87 otherwise. His foundations are in the holy mountains. The Lord loves the gates of Zion more than all the dwellings of Jacob. Glorious things were said concerning you, O city of God. I will make mention of Rahab and Babylon to those who know me. And behold, foreigners and the people of Tyre and Ethiopia, these were born there. A man will say, Mother Zion, and a man was born in her. For the Most High himself founded it. The Lord shall describe it in a written account of the peoples, and of the rulers, and of those who were born in her. How glad are all who have their dwelling in you. This is picking up, it's actually picking up that second theme about the Gentiles again. Right? Because Zion is referring to Historically, it's referring to the mountain that the temple was built on, right? And so, in Jerusalem, right? So that's that was the physical city of God. We've talked before about, you know, that the, the city of God, what it represents, larger than that, the city of God, the eternal city of God, right? The New Jerusalem. But see, this is mentioning the old foreigners, the people of Tyre. Right, or Phoenicians, Ethiopia. Right, tires up to the north. Ethiopians down here to the south. So you've got your sort of two ends in terms of people who are far away. We'll say that they were born in her. Right. So that that's not saying that's not. Saying, and there are Jewish interpreters who interpret this as referring to the nation of Israel being refounded in 1946 and Jews coming home back from Ethiopia. Right, but that's clearly not what it's saying. It's not saying they're going to have Israeli citizenship. Right? It's saying that people from these different countries are all going to claim their citizenship in the city of God. Right? In the city of God overall. Right? Not just the physical city of Jerusalem. So the idea being they're all going to be included. And they're not going to be included as second class citizens. Right? Which is important. Because one of the ways that these passages about the Gentiles were interpreted by the Jews was that essentially the Jews were going to take over the world. Right? The Messiah would come, they'd conquer the world, and the Gentiles would be their slaves. Right? Their lackeys, their workforce, they would sort of rule over everyone. Well, that's not the picture here, right? Because these people from Ethiopia, these people from Tyre, these people from all over the place, right, will say, Mother Zion, a man was born in her. Right? They're going to be natural born citizens the same as as the Jews. The same as the Jews. They're going to have the same citizenship. All right? The city God is mother of all. Of all of them. That's going to make the Jews unhappy. <laughs> but again, that's what this is pointing to. And of course the previous psalm gives us the timetable of when that's going to happen. <laughs> right? Of when that's going to happen. So this is this is beyond just... See, there's been a shift here. We saw it first, you know, in the, in the Torah, in the Pentateuch, first five books of the Bible, it was, you guys need to be better than the other nations, to be an example to them, right? And so that they will want to be like you. But the promises that God is giving in the Old Testament move beyond that, beyond just, oh, they'll want to live like you live. Worship your God. To, but that they will be included. Because they are, after all, like the last psalm said, these are the Gentiles who God made. <laughs> he made them too. Right. And so, it's going to be opened up to everyone. Everyone's going to be included on the same level. Okay, so the next psalm, 
Psalm 87, Orthodox Study Bible 88 otherwise, is the most depressing psalm in the Psalms. Pretty much, we've, we've seen some pretty down, downbeat psalms, right? Where people are in trouble and put upon. and right. But usually there's something at the end about how we still hope in the Lord and the Lord will deliver us. This one, not so much. <laughs> this one is just kind of downbeat. So I say that, prepare you in advance. Interestingly enough, um, this psalm is one of the six psalms read at the beginning of Matt. It's not the Orthodox people. I guess <laughs> somebody wasn't a morning person the way it is. Well, what's interesting in how those psalms are arrayed, are arranged is you get this one that's real downbeat, then the one right after it starts out, "Bless the Lord, O my soul." All it is with be blessed is So you get like a really upbeat psalm right afterwards to kind of try to level it out. <laughs> a little advertising: morning prayers are a lot more often this week. Yeah. And now you can see also in the Orthodox Study Bible this, this big long prescript. This is interpreting those as names. There's a bunch of terms there that we think are musical terms. You don't know exactly what they mean. So like for the Mahalat to respond, that was probably a, a term in terms of the chanters. You know, we're not sure exactly what that, that's how it would have been performed originally. Okay, so Psalm 87, Orthodox Study Bible, 88 otherwise. O Lord God of my salvation, I cry day and night before you. Let my prayer come before you. Incline your ear to my supplication, O Lord. For my soul is filled with sorrows, and my soul draws near to Hades. I am counted among those who go down into the pit. I am like a helpless man, free among the dead. Like slain men thrown down and sleeping in a grave, whom you remember no more, but they are removed from your hand. They laid me in the lowest pit, in dark places, and in the shadows of death. Your wrath rested upon me, and you brought all your billows over me. You removed my acquaintances far from me. They made me an abomination among themselves. I was betrayed and did not go forth. My eyes weakened from poverty. O Lord, I cried to you the whole day long. I spread out my hands to you. Will you work wonders for the dead, or will physicians raise them up and acknowledge you? Shall anyone in the grave describe your mercy and your truth and destruction? Shall your wonders be known in darkness and your righteousness in a forgotten land? But I cry to you, O Lord, and in the morning my prayer shall come near to you. Why, O Lord, do you reject my soul and turn away your face from me? I am poor and in troubles for my youth, but having been exalted, I was humbled and brought into despair. Your fierce anger passed over me, and your terrors greatly troubled me. They compassed me like water all the day long, they surrounded me at once. You removed far from me neighbor and friend and my acquaintances because of my misery. Wasn't that a happy and there's no sort of, as I said, there's no uh, kind of payoff there at the end. It's even more depressing in the Hebrew. In the Hebrew, the very last line is, the darkness is my only friend. <laughs> Just to cap it off. And that, that last line in the Hebrew is, uh, is where Simon and Garfunkel got to... Uh, the first line of the sound of silence. Hello, dark is my old friend. Yeah, that's where it comes from. I still have that note. Fortunately, they're not performing at the Civic Center, or I might not have it. Oh, man. So that's... So this... This psalm is generally interpreted as being about Christ and being about his sufferings. And one of the things that's pointed to is in verse 5, it's like I'm like a helpless man, free among the dead. Right? What does free among the dead mean? It means you're not dead, but you can walk around like it. Well, in this case, in this case, you're dead, but you're. <laughs> yeah, and so the, the idea here is that's generally interpreted as being that Christ, unlike everyone else who's ever been dead, was still free to leave Hades. Right? He was able to, as he said, you know, I lay my, down my life and I'm able to pick it back up again. <laughs> and so 
Christ rather than being, you know, uh, locked up in Hades. Right? Is, is free among the dead. So this is sort of the the Holy Saturday psalm. <laughs> before you get to before you get to uh, Pascha, before you get to Easter. Yeah, this is another of those passages where it seems like hypothetical questions that it turns out not to be. Will you work wonders for the dead? Will physicians raise them up and acknowledge you? Shall your wonders be known in darkness and yeah. your righteousness in a forgotten land? Those yeah. sound like hypothetical questions <laughs> until Christ comes along and says, yes. Well, <laughs> my righteousness will be known in a forgotten land. Right. Physicians right. will raise them up and acknowledge them. Right. Right. And so that's that's referring to what what Christ is going to do in the in the, uh, in the grave. So that that idea of Christ in Hades appearing to those who are in darkness, right, to lead to lead them out. And so it shouldn't be. Though, like I said, it's it's depressing if you just <laughs> take it as a prayer. Right? It's if you understand it in that context, right? That in that Holy Saturday context, right? And that's why it's one of the six psalms in in Matins. Is we're going through the cycle where we remember Christ's suffering, His death, and His resurrection as we go through the week. Right. So that's an important. And we can't, we can't skip. We can't skip. We can't go straight from... We like to kind of go straight from uh, Nativity to Easter. Right? Just take the happy feasts. Right? It's like Christmas, presents, and then Easter, food. Right? You know? But there's... The, the way that leads from one to the other goes through some of these dark places that not only do we have to go through, but just realistically in our lives, we go through them. You know, I, I'd love to meet somebody who never had any dark times in their life. <laughs> and I would say, blessed are you, sir, <laughs> right? that, that God gave you this gift of never having to go through any of this. But for most of us, it's just reality. It's just reality. And so it's important. This is actually a good psalm to pray when we're in those when we're in those periods. Right? Because God doesn't expect us to skip. God doesn't expect us when we're hurting and when we're suffering to act like everything's okay, especially not around Him. Right? Christ certainly didn't. When Christ was being crucified and He was praying these psalms that we've seen, these psalms are like, well, you know, it's bad now, but everything's going to turn out okay. Right? <laughs> When Christ was suffering, he laid out his suffering in front of God. Wasn't there that one? So this is how it feels. Well, well no, that's, 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 yeah, that's not relevant. The, but so, that this having these psalms and these prayers is important because they, they show us that when we're in those parts of our life, God is there too. And we can be honest with God about those parts of our life as well. That it's not, God doesn't expect us to, again, always pretend everything's okay. Well, there's a lot of people who have it worse. <laughs> you know? I need to cheer up. Right? That's, that's, not, that's not how it works. Does anybody have any other questions about that one before we... Okay. Psalm 88, Orthodox Study Bible, 89 otherwise. O Lord, I will sing of your mercies forever. I will proclaim your truth with my mouth from generation to generation. For you said, mercy shall be built up forever. Your truth shall be prepared in the heavens. I made a covenant with my chosen ones. I swore to David my servant. I shall prepare your seed forever. And I shall build your throne from generation to generation. The heavens shall confess your wonders, O Lord, in your truth in the church of the saints. For who in the clouds shall be compared to the Lord? And who among the sons of God shall be compared to the Lord? God is glorified in the council of saints. He is great and fearful toward all round about him. O Lord God of hosts, who is like you? You are powerful, O Lord, and your truth is around you. You are master of the sea's strength, and you calm the surging of its waves. You humbled the arrogant man as though he were wounded. And with the arm of your power, you scattered your enemies. The heavens belong to you, and the earth is yours. You founded the world in all its fullness. 
You created the north wind and the seas. Tabor and Hermon shall greatly rejoice in your name. Your arm rules with power. Let your hand be strengthened. Let your right hand be exalted. The foundation of your throne is righteousness and judgment. Mercy and truth shall go before your face. Blessed are the people who know glad shouting, O Lord. They shall walk in the light of your face and shall greatly rejoice in your name the whole day long. And they shall be exalted in your righteousness. For you are the boast of their power and in your good pleasure our horn shall be exalted. For our defense is from the Lord and from the Holy One of Israel, our King. Then you spoke to your holy ones in a vision and you said, I established help for a mighty one. I raised up a chosen one for my people. I found David my servant, I anointed him with my holy oil. For my hand shall support him and my arm shall strengthen him. The enemy shall have no advantage against him. And the son of lawlessness shall not continue doing evil to him. I will cut his enemies to pieces before his face and I shall put to flight those who hate him. My truth and my mercy are with him and in my name shall his horn be exalted. I will put his hand in the sea and his right hand in the rivers. You shall call upon me saying, You are my father, my God, and the protector of my salvation. I shall make him my firstborn higher than the kings of the earth. I shall keep my mercy for him forever and my covenant shall be trustworthy with him. I shall establish his seed unto ages of ages and his throne is the days of heaven. If his sons forsake my law and do not walk in my judgments, if they profane my ordinances and do not keep my commandments, I shall visit their transgressions with a rod and their sins with a whip. But I will not turn away my mercy from him, nor will I act unjustly with my truth, nor will I profane my covenant, and I will not reject the things that proceeded from my lips. Once for all I swore in my holy place that I would not lie to David. His seed shall remain forever, and his throne is the sun before me, and as the moon that is established forever and is a faithful witness in heaven. But you pushed him away and scorned him. You rejected your anointed. You overturned the covenant of your servant. You profaned his sanctuary to the ground. You pulled down all his walls. You put cowardice in his stronghold. All who traveled through here robbed him. He was a disgrace to his neighbors. You exalted the right hand of his enemies. You delighted all his adversaries. You turned away your help from his sword, and you did not support him in his war. You deprived him of purification. You broke his throne to pieces on the ground. You shortened the days of his time. You poured down shame upon him. How long, O Lord, will you turn away to the end? Will your wrath always burn like fire? Let my substance be remembered as to what sort it is. For did you create all the sons of men in vain? What kind of man is there who will live and not see death? Will he deliver his soul from the hand of Hades? Where, O Lord, are your mercies of old, which in your truth you swore to David? Remember, O Lord, the reproach of your servants I bore in my bosom, the reproach of many nations, wherewith your enemies scorned, O Lord, wherewith they scorned the change of your anointed. Blessed is the Lord forever. Amen. Amen. Okay, so that's a big, long, not the longest one we're going to read, but a pretty long one. And you can see there's a couple of shifts. We have sort of a, there's sort of an introduction at the beginning in the first five verses. It sort of sets up that it's talking about David and his seed. And the seed there is singular in the original. Okay, and then we have this long passage starting with verse 6 that's talking about God's creation, how he created the world and everything in it, his power, how he's more powerful than any other thing that anybody could worship. All right, and that continues That continues until about 19. And then in verse 20, it picks up again talking about David and what was sworn to David. That goes through about verse 38. Then verse 39 through 46, there's this turn, right, where something is scorned and destroyed and torn down. We'll talk about that a little more in a second. And then verse 47 there to the end is sort of saying, how long, O oh Lord, are you going to continue to, to reject us? Okay. So let me start by pointing out a liturgical thing. Verse 13, the second half. Tabor and Hermon shall greatly rejoice in your name is one of the prokimena that we use for the Feast of the Transfiguration. Now, at first it may seem like, oh, well, the Transfiguration happened on Mount Tabor, so there's, oh, hey, look, Tabor, let's use that for, right, prokimena. That's not why. That's not why. Because we're going to see as we look more at this psalm, 
that this is connected to Jesus and to the transfiguration by more than just the fact that Mount Tabor is mentioned here. Okay. So we already have right off the bat verse 4 and 5 there the covenant that we remember with David that his seed singular would sit upon his throne forever. Now this was commonly interpreted back at the time well before this psalm was written because this psalm was written during the exile but this was commonly interpreted as meaning David's family line, this succession of kings would go on forever. Right? Well, by now, they're in exile, so we know that didn't happen. Right? His line wasn't wiped out, but they didn't reign on his throne in Jerusalem <laughs> for a linear succession of time. Right? So that interpretation goes right out. Okay. And what, so what we see here is there's this promise and that David's going to have a seed. Then we have this long description of the glory of God. God's glory and power. His reference to him in the, in the council of the angels. Right. And then the promise that's made to David. Right. And this promise that's made to David here, the way it's described, let me ask you, did this happen in David's life? I'll put his hand in the sea in verse 26. I'll put his hand in the sea and his right hand in the rivers. Right? That meaning, you know, he's going to rule over everything from the sea, meaning the Mediterranean, <laughs> to the rivers, meaning the Tigris and the Euphrates. Right? Did David rule over all that? No. <laughs> right? To the ends of the earth. Um... Were all of his enemies cut to pieces before his face? Well, some of them. <laughs> um, verse 27, He shall call upon me, saying, You are my Father, my God, and the protector of my salvation. And then verse 4, I shall make him my firstborn higher than all the kings of the earth. Was David higher than all the kings of the earth in his time? Were any of his immediate blood relatives that we read about in Kings and Chronicles higher than all the kings of the earth? They had a smaller kingdom than the northern kingdom of Israel. Let alone Assyria or Babylon or Egypt. or Right? So we know, so we know that this, this promise isn't just a promise that, oh, here, David, here's the nice things I'm going to do for you while you're alive. Right? Which probably wouldn't bear mentioning in a psalm at this point anyway. Right? This, that this, these are promises about this seed. Right? It's the seed where they're going to find the, the fulfillment. Okay. Notice also, this is something we've talked about before in the Psalms, but notice that part of the promise, promise is, starting in verse 32, if they profane my ordinances and do not keep my commandments, I shall visit their transgressions with a rod and their sins with a whip. But I will not turn away my mercy from him, nor will I act unjustly with my truth, nor will I profane my covenant. But part of the promise is, I'm going to come in and discipline you when you get off track. I'm not going to let you go and destroy yourself all the way. Part of the promise is that God is going to give chastisement. Right? Okay, so let me suggest now that the reason, the reason that that verse, the reason that we're directed to this psalm on the Feast of Transfiguration is that this psalm sets these two pictures side by side. We have this picture of the seed of David, God's firstborn, who's going to call him father, right? He's going to rule over the world forever. And this picture of God's glory, God who created the earth, God's glory surrounded by the angels, put next to each other here in this all, right? Well, what happens at the transfiguration? The apostles see are looking at the person of Jesus and they see the glory of God. Is that right? These two things are drawn together in the person of Jesus. That's why we're directed to this psalm. So we'll make that identification. Right? So we'll say, oh, Jesus is this seed they're talking about. <laughs> right? Who manifests the glory of God is going to rule. Now with that in mind, with that in mind, 
verses 39 through 46. Okay. But you pushed him away and scorned him. You rejected your anointed. And remember, anointed, literally, your Christ. You overturned the covenant of your servant. You profaned his sanctuary to the ground. You pulled down all his walls. You put cowardice in his stronghold. Right? So it starts out, it seems to be very clearly talking about the king. Right? And now it sounds like walls. <laughs> right? So is, when it starts talking about the walls, is it talking about the temple or the city of Jerusalem? Well, let me suggest, what does Jesus say when he's walking through the temple that gets him in so much trouble? He says, if you tear this, destroy this temple, I'll rebuild it in three days. Okay? And he was referring to himself. So when it says, you pulled down all his walls, talking about the servant, the king, right? This is talking about Christ. Right? You pulled down all his walls, you put cowardice in his stronghold. All who traveled through there robbed him. He was a disgrace to his neighbor. You exalted the right hand of his enemies. You delighted all his adversaries. You turned away your help from his sword. You did not support him in his war. You probably your purification. You broke his throne to pieces on the ground. You shortened the days of his time. Christ was about 30 <laughs> when he died. Right? So, this piece. Well, if you don't look too close, you could interpret it as talking about Jerusalem. Right? If you look at this psalm at a very shallow level, you could say, well, this is saying, hey God, you promised a bunch of stuff to David and now our city got destroyed. What's up? Right? <laughs> okay? Very shallow level. You look at it more narrowly, we could tell, first of all, we know it's talking about Christ. Right? So if this is talking about Christ, then this passage all of a sudden becomes about something different. And this becomes one of those passages that Jesus is referring to when he says, have you not read the scriptures that the Christ must suffer and then enter into his glory? Right? When, when we profess the Nicene Creed that Christ died and rose again according to the scriptures. Right? This is one of those passages we're referring to. Jesus is saying, what, didn't you read that? Right? It says right here, you rejected your Christ. End of verse 39. Right? The Christ would be rejected. It's right there in the Psalms. You guys haven't read that, you rabbis? <laughs> you didn't pick up on that? Okay. And so then, James, we have another set of those rhetorical questions that turn out to not be rhetorical. Right? Verse 49. What kind of man is there who will live and not see death? <laughs> right? Okay. Will he deliver his soul from the hand of Hades? Of course not. <laughs> right? Did you create all the sons of men in vain? Okay. So, that's, that's where this psalm is going, and that's why it has this import to the, trans, to the transfiguration. Right? And remember, even that part about Christ's suffering... In the Traparian and the Transfiguration, what do we say? We say Christ revealed his glory to the apostles insofar as they could bear it, so that when they saw the crucifixion, right, they would remember and know that he was God. So that when they saw him suffering, they didn't remember very well. Well, <laughs> but they should have, because they should have read this psalm. <laughs> well, my question is this, because of David being mentioned through it, and right. how he is portrayed and how he is. I wonder with humility that David write this song. It's the first thing that comes to my mind. And the second thing, we look here at the word church. Again, we see that. Right. Uh, verse 6. And your truth in the church of the saints. Right. Not in the temple, not in the synagogue, but in the what? In the church. Yeah, the assembly. Yeah. The assembly. And I, uh, I look at that, and that's why I said, you know, you it, it, it goes on to the building David up. Right. If I were David, and I'm obviously not, but I'm just <laughs> saying, how could I possibly, knowing the Lord as I know the Lord and His visions, keep saying, you gave me, 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 a lot of focus on me. Okay? 
I see very little humility here toward David as an individual. Right. Okay? And that gives me the question, did David write this song? Of course, you can add credit to it. But, and then, and then to, to be so in tune with the fourth of the things coming of the Lord revealing to him of, of the transfiguration of Jesus. Right. Uh, just, just really, really very spiritual, very dynamic that I probably, my simple mind can't comprehend. <laughs> well, yeah, it doesn't say that David wrote it. That doesn't necessarily mean he didn't. Okay. Right. <laughs> It means, it means we don't know. I mean, it doesn't say who wrote it. The only inscription is for Ethan the Israelite. And Ethan doesn't show up anywhere else. <laughs> we know him in the Old Testament so we can place him. We can place him in time. Yeah. Any other questions on that one before we... Why the church? I just why, the, why the church? Yeah, why that? Well, the... <laughs> well, the I literally, I very literally, literally, what it says there is the assembly of the holy ones. So the church is the assembly. Well, that phrase is used for two things. It's used for the church, okay, and it's used for God sitting and throned amongst the angels, and they're used interchangeably. Because the two are interchangeable. Remember in the tabernacle, right? They sewed into all the curtains the angels, right? Because when they were in there worshiping God, they were in the presence of God, surrounded by the. It's the same thing, right? And so, when, for example, the beginning of First Corinthians, Saint Paul writes to a whole bunch of very, very sinful people. It says to the holy ones in Corinth after he's about to chew them out for all kinds of sexual immorality and everything, but calls them the holy ones in Corinth, right? The reason he's able to call them holy ones, call them saints, is because when they come together for worship, right, they're participating in this, they're part of this assembly before God, worshiping God. Okay. Okay. Right. Yeah. Um, one seventeen it says talks about their form shall be exalted, and then in twenty four it talks about his form. What does that mean? What is this form that they're talking about? Oh, the flag or something. The horn. We talked about this. I don't know if it was last week or a couple yeah, weeks we did. ago. We yeah. About the horns the uh, well, the but uh, this is referring to horns like a uh, like a bull has horns. Sort of the symbol of strength and power in. Uh, sort of, yeah. It's a similar kind of thing. That was the, that was the symbolism of strength and power was the bull, yeah. right? And sort of the bigger the horns were, right? That was sort of a symbol of power. So you'll get these. You'll have these statues and idols of Baal, for example, with these bulls with these comically long <laughs> horns, you know, sticking up in the air. You know, to crazy extremes, but that's the idea being very, very powerful. Right. And, and so, when they talk about exalting or enlarging a horn, they're talking about making someone more powerful, their power increasing. Okay. Um, and that's why, like in verse 18, there it says, For you are the boast of their power, and in your good pleasure our horn shall be exalted. Right? Those are the two things. It's God who gives them power what they're saying and the horn is a, is an image of power it's re sort of repeating so in, itself so in 24 when they're faithful then it exalts god's power is that what that means god exalts their power their power because that image of the hand in the sea and the hand in the, that's sort of the extent of his rule right so that the picture there is that that god expanded the power and territory and might of the good rulers, <laughs> the rulers who started to follow him, and the ones who didn't ended up losing everything. Right? That's the sort of the surface analogy. Now, the intercessory prayer and madness that follows the gospel 
Psalm 50. Salt the Lord of Orthodox Christians and said, I put yeah. down upon my great mercy. Right. That means, and it mentions all the saints. Yeah. The of saints. So it's actually that's expand the power and influence. Expand the power. <laughs> okay. So Psalm 89. Or the next study Bible, 90 otherwise. This is probably the oldest psalm. Because it is attributed to Moses. <laughs> so, if you, if you ever need any more proof that they're not put together in chronological order, this is it. <laughs> Number 89 or 90 is the oldest one. <laughs> That's Psalm 89, Orthodox Study Bible, 90 otherwise. O Lord, you became a refuge to us in generation and generation, before the mountains were made and before the earth and the world were formed. And from everlasting to everlasting you are. Do not let man be turned back to humiliation. And you said, Return, you sons of men, for a thousand years in your sight are like yesterday which passed and like a watch in the night. Years shall be objects of contempt to them. In the morning let man pass by like grass. In the morning let him blossom and pass by in the evening let him fall off, be dried up and withered. For we fainted in your wrath, and in your wrath we were troubled. You set our transgressions before you, our time in the light of your face. For all our days failed, and in your wrath we fainted. Our years were spent in thought like a spider. As for the days of our years, their span is seventy years. But if we stay strong, perhaps eighty. And most of them are labor and pain. For meekness came upon us, and we shall be chastened. Who knows the power of your wrath, and who knows your anger because of your fear? So make known your right hand to us, that we may number our days, and our heart may be bound with wisdom. Return, O Lord, how long, and be entreated concerning your servants. We were filled with your mercy in the morning, and in all our days we greatly rejoiced and were glad. Gladden us in return for the days you humbled us, for the years we saw evil things. And behold your servants and your works, and guide their sons. And let the brightness of the Lord our God be upon us, and prosper for us the works of our hands. Okay. So now, where where in Moses does this fit? Is the question. What was, assuming that the attribution is correct and Moses wrote this, or this is based originally on something Moses wrote because he wrote in a language that didn't exist but at this time. But what would this be about? <coughs> Well, remember, <coughs> Moses leads the people out of Egypt, right? They go to Mount Sinai, they receive the law, they receive the covenant, right? This is their first visit with God, right? God comes and visits them and gives them this. After that, the rest of Moses' life and the rest of those people's life, not great, Right. <laughs> right. It's pretty much it's pretty steep downhill from there, right? Moses doesn't even get down off the mountain before they're already. Verse seven on. Yeah. yeah. Mess it up. Right? And so again, we're dealing with this pattern. Right? This pattern that we saw with Adam and Eve walking in the garden with God and then sitting and being cast out. Right? And then God coming and visiting his people and giving them this covenant, and then they break the covenant and wander off and die in the desert. Right? And then God brings the next generation of them into the land. And they don't keep his covenant, and they end up in exile. This cycle we've talked about. Right? And so Moses, within his frame of that cycle, is already calling for God to intervene and put a stop to this cycle. Right? That's what he's talking about when he says. In verse 12, so make known your right hand to us. Right? So he's asking God to step in at that point in time and show them the way. And fix things already. Right? Yeah. And, and in verse 13, return, O Lord, how long? Right? So when people, when people say to me, and I understand their sentiment, but when people come to me and say, wow, with the way things are going in the world, Jesus' return must be coming awful soon. Right? I say, yeah, Moses thought that too. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, and, and we have to remember, like Moses tells us here, time's kind of relative. A thousand years to God are like a day. So, you know. 
Like, Moses was just three days ago. I mean, yeah. <laughs> Moses was you notice Moses was complaining. You know, we only live seventy or eighty years. Well, no, he's not. He's not complaining there. He's not complaining there. What he's what he's saying is he's he's expressing the situation that mankind is in. Right now, remember, remember Moses also gave us the Torah. How did it come to be that human beings only live seventy or eighty years? Uh, the Lord reduced our days so that after the flood in Genesis. Gen- yeah. Yeah. In Genesis, after the flood, human beings lived much longer before the flood, but became so evil and did so much evil in the world. Right, that God had to shorten. <laughs> had to shorten their lives to prevent the amount of evil and sin that was growing up in the world, right? And so this is part of him crying, you know, how long is it going to be, Lord, before you come and intervene? You know, we live 70 years, if we're strong, maybe 80, right? And most of our life is spent, right? Most of them are labor and pain. Right? It's not like those 70 to 80 years are a paradise that we you know, enjoy every minute of. Right? We have this, this short little span of life. And, you know, the, there are a lot of references in the Psalms. This is the only one to, to man being like grass and like flowers of grass that, that die and disappear. And I recently saw an example of this. So I was out doing yard work and there was this kudzu vine that had grown up the side of the TV cable going up the side of our house to the second floor. This vine, and it wrapped around the cable, right? Well, it, you can rip out the cable trying to get... So I went down to the bottom and cut off the vine. Sure. Right? I did that in the morning, and I came out to take one of the dogs out that night, and already that night, the whole thing was brown. All the way up. It was all brown, starting to droop. The next day, it was already starting to fall apart. It dropped. That's, that's the image here. <laughs> Right, that compared to God <laughs> and God's eternity, our lives are like blip, and it's done. Yeah, that's what that's what Moses is contrasting. He's contrasting. He said, "God, you were all powerful and great. You created the world. We're a mess. <laughs> we're a mess. We need you to come and fix this. Right? We need you to come and fix this." And of course, the ultimate. The ultimate answer of why is God is giving time for as many people as possible to come in and find salvation. Right? And he's working on his own timetable. So, but yeah, if you start thinking, it has to be soon. Remember Moses. <laughs> but there's the opposite problem. Sometimes I've been saying, you know, compared to the way things used to be, Christians today are doing pretty well, so they're not in much danger. And then it gets pointed out to me that a lot of the sins they were committing all that time ago are committing now, and we just don't notice it as much. Right. It's all relative to your perspective. <laughs> okay. So any other questions on that one before we... Okay. Psalm 90, Orthodox Study Bible, 91 otherwise. He who dwells in the help of the Most High shall lodge in the shelter of the God of Heaven. He shall say to the Lord, You are my protector and my refuge. My God, I will hope in him. For he shall free me from the snare of the hunters and from every troubling word. He shall overshadow you with his shoulders and under his wings you shall hope. His truth shall encircle you with a shield. You shall not be frightened by fear at night nor from an arrow that flies by day nor by a thing moving in darkness nor by mishap and a demon of noonday. A thousand shall fall at your side and ten thousand at your right hand yet it shall not come near you. But you shall observe with your eyes, and you shall see the reward of sinners. For you, O Lord, are my hope. You made the Most High your refuge. Evil shall not come to you, and a scourge shall not draw near your dwelling. For he shall command his angels concerning you to keep you in all your ways. In their hands they shall bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. You shall tread upon the asp and the basilisk, and you shall trample the lion and dragon. For he hoped in me, and I will deliver him. I will shelter him, because he knew my name. He shall call upon me, and I will hear him. I am with him in affliction, and I will deliver and glorify him. With length of days I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Okay. A couple things about this psalm. Number one, Father Scott, you're not allowed to answer this. You're a ringer. 
Does anybody know what service this psalm is read at the beginning of? Maybe the final chapter. You attend a lot of them. <laughs> Everybody here has attended several of them in their time. No? I'll give you a hint. You probably have heard George Davis read. <laughs> Quite a few times. It is the psalm that's read at the beginning of the funeral service. Oh. <laughs> okay. First thing out of the box. It's the read at the beginning of the funeral service. Okay, so we're going to talk about it in a second here. Why? Why this? I mean, there's plenty of psalms. Pick. Why is this one the one for a funeral service? There's another place. There's a place in the New Testament where this psalm gets part of this psalm gets quoted. By an unlikely person. <laughs> yes. <laughs> right. When Satan comes to Jesus to tempt him, one of the temptations is for Jesus to throw himself down from the the top of the temple. Right? Satan is definitely a biblical general. <laughs> yeah. Because and he quotes he quotes verse for verse eleven, for he shall command his angels concerning you to keep you in all your ways. In their hands they shall bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. Right? So he says, hey, isn't that what God said? Let's see it. (laughs) Yeah, let's see it. And Jesus says to him, what? He says, it's also written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. (laughs) Well, what does he mean by that? Well, he means by that, and what Satan means by that, (laughs) because Satan was around when this stuff was being written too, right? is this psalm is all about God's protection first and foremost of Christ. Right? It's first and foremost Christ who dwells in the help of the Most High. Sits in the shadow of the Almighty. Right? And who who he'll protect. Okay? Now that may sound strange. Right? I mean that's how Satan applies, right? Satan says, hey, you're the Messiah. <laughs> and Jesus, notice, doesn't correct him. Jesus doesn't say, oh no, that's not what that means. <laughs> right? He says, you don't put the Lord your God to the test. Right? You don't put his protection to the test. Okay. But it may sound strange to say this is about him protecting Jesus, because Jesus didn't look very protected most of his life. <laughs> right? I mean, when he's getting beaten, when he's getting mocked, when he's getting crucified... Right? Not a lot of angels swooping in to save him. <laughs> but that was but, man. If you take this literally. Well, listen. This is talking about your enemies. This right. is like a thousand of your enemies will fall <laughs> yeah. by the sword and you'll, you'll be totally safe. But what happens when Jesus dies? When Jesus dies and goes, goes into Hades. Right. He, he, is he in any danger? No. He, he went in, he come out. Like the opposite. When he shows up in Hades, it's Satan who's in trouble. Yeah. <laughs> it's death and, and Hades themselves that are in trouble. He's not in trouble. Right? So that's why he'd go to hell and bring back the same. So even when he goes people. out into Hades, mm-hmm. right? God is with him and protecting him. Okay? And so, if this is true of Christ, then this is also true for people who are in Christ. Right? In the epistle reading that we read during the funeral service, the same service, it talks about the dead in Christ. (laughs) The dead in Christ shall rise first. So if it's true of Christ, it's true for the people who are in Christ. So we read this psalm at the beginning of the funeral service. Because we're saying, this person, we're going to put them down into the grave. But we trust God to go with their soul and protect them. Because they're in Christ. So this is a promise. We're, We're reminding ourselves by reading this psalm at the beginning of the funeral service of God's promise. God's promise is to protect us. Even after this life. 
that our soul has departed the body, but it's safe. It's safe with God. Right. So that's that's why this is the this is the funeral song. Right. Because of that that promise. That we as Christians don't sit there and go, well, they're dead, their soul's gone. Who knows what happened to them? <laughs> Worry about what happened. It's safe. We know it's safe. Because it's safe with Christ. Christ was safe. We can do one, maybe two more, I think. Psalm 91, Orthodox Study Bible, 92 otherwise. It is good to give thanks to the Lord and to sing to your name, O Most High, to proclaim your mercy in the morning and your truth at night. On the harp of ten strings with an ode on the lyre, for you make me glad, O Lord, with your work, and I will greatly rejoice in the works of your hands. How magnificent are your works, O Lord! Your thoughts are exceedingly deep. A man without discernment shall not know these things, and a senseless man shall not understand them. <clears throat> when sinners grow like grass, and all the workers of lawlessness have arrogant looks, it is so that they may be destroyed unto ages of ages. But you, O Lord, are most high forever. For behold, your enemies shall perish, and all who work lawlessness shall be scattered abroad. And my horn shall be exalted like the unicorn. There's your unicorns again. <laughs> and my old age shall be blessed with rich mercy. My eye looked upon my enemies, and my ears shall hear of evildoers who rise up against me. The righteous shall flourish like a palm tree. You shall be multiplied like the cedar in Lebanon. Those planted in the house of the Lord shall blossom forth in the courts of our God. They shall still be increased in a rich old age, and shall be prospering, so as to proclaim, The Lord my God is upright, and there is no wrongdoing in him. The concept I want to talk about here is, you know, in verse 8, when sinners grow like grass and all the workers of lawlessness have arrogant looks, it is so that they may be destroyed unto ages of ages. Right? So I want to talk about that phrase because we say it all the time. Right? Unto ages of ages. You ever wonder what that means? It just means a long time. <laughs> right? How long is an age? <laughs> right? Is an age a thousand years? An age of ages? Right, what, what it, what is it? And what's interesting is that part of what reveals what this is really talking about is a couple places where it's translated differently. Okay. One is if you're familiar at all with with Western liturgies, with Roman Catholic liturgics, right? When they get to the end of most of the prayers, where we sing unto ages of ages, they say world without end. <laughs> World without end. World without you say, <laughs> so you say, well, wait, what does that mean? That means the world's never going to come to an end? I thought the world was going to come to an end, right? <laughs> that was the whole point. Let me give you another place where it's translated differently. In the Nicene Creed, right? we say that Jesus Christ was begotten of the Father for all worlds. Right? That's another place where it's translated differently. So, well, it's, the original word, word is actually in Greek ion, which is sometimes uh, transliterated into English as eon. Eon. Which you'll hear, you know, Carl Sagan or somebody, eons of time. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> eons of time. They're picking up on this the same thing. But the idea is of worlds we have at the end of the creed we're looking for the life of the world to come. Right? So we have this world that we live in. Right? Before that there's the angelic world. God created the angelic beings. Right? After this world there's going to be the world to come. Right? These are the ones that we know about. <laughs> right? So when we say Christ is begotten of the Father before all worlds, we mean before there was anything created, right? Before there was such a thing as time, <laughs> right? Which we can't really wrap our heads around. But before all that, right? And when we say unto ages of ages or world without end or 
talking about the world to come, that means in in the next world and into, right? Because we don't know what time will be like there either. Right? That's, that's what's reflecting. So when it says here that they're going to be destroyed unto ages of ages, that doesn't mean God's going to be like grinding them forever. <laughs> right? The idea is that is that they're destroyed, meaning the world to come, they ain't going to be around. That's what it's, that's what it's referring to. Right? It's saying, when this new world comes and the righteous man is flourishing like a palm tree, right, and we're all enjoying all these good things in the world to come, these sinners are going to be long gone. They rise up like grass. <laughs> Again, that's a metaphor. Right? right now they're walking around with a smirk on their face. <laughs> but they're not gonna they're not gonna last into this new world that's coming. Okay. And if you're a worker of lawlessness and you don't have an arrogant look, are you okay? No. <laughs> <laughs> the sign that you're a worker of lawlessness is that arrogant look. <laughs> Okay, so let's do one more since it's short. Psalm uh, 92, Orthodox Study Bible, 93 otherwise. <coughs> this one is by David, and it has a strange prescript. This for the day before the Sabbath when the earth was settled. Okay, what's that referring to? That's refer well, it's referring to a Genesis 1. That's referring to the sixth day. Right, the sixth day, that's what God created land, animals, and, and humans. Right, so that's when the earth was settled. Now, what exactly it means that this was for the sixth day of creation, since that was a, would have been a long time ago, <laughs> David, David was writing, it probably means that that's what it was, it was, a, it was a hymn recalling that <laughs> or referring it, not the one that they sang that day. Since The Lord reigns, he clothed himself with majesty. The Lord clothed and girded himself with power, and he established the world which shall not be moved. Your throne is prepared from of old, you are from everlasting. The rivers, O Lord, lift up, the rivers lift up their voices, because of the voices of their many waters. Marvelous are the billows of the sea, wondrous is the Lord on high. Your testimonies are very much believed. Holiness is proper to your house, O Lord, unto length of days. And I'll do another one. And again, Father Scott, you're a ringer, so you can't answer. <laughs> Does anybody recognize the first verse of this? Yeah. Right. <laughs> Saturday night, great vespers. This is the default pro <laughs> This is the normal, unless there's a feast or something that has its own pro This is the regular one for Saturday, for Saturday night, leading into Sunday. Right, leading into Sunday. Why? Well, here's why. There's a creation connection, but it's a little bit different. Okay, we've talked before, way back, it's probably been a year or two since we talked about this. Uh, we talked about the concept that they had prophetically, and we'll, we'll see more of this once in a couple years here when we start <laughs> Daniel and some of the minor prophets. This idea that... that uh, one of the pictures that was given of the new creation of the world to come right, in the Old Testament is of an eighth day. Right? There was the seven days of, of creation. Right? And we see that in the New Testament that the, that gets extended all the way up to Jesus' time. Because remember, Jesus is walking with his disciples and they start picking heads of grain to eat on the Sabbath. And a bunch of smart alecky Pharisees come along and say, hey, they're technically harvesting wheat on the Sabbath. Right? <laughs> That's a sin. Right? And Jesus says, says to them what? He takes them all the way back to Genesis 1. Again. Right? And he says to them, God is not resting. He is working even unto this very day, and I work as well. And the next verse is how bad the Pharisees got at him, both for having one of them. And for having equated himself with God. <laughs> God. <laughs> right. 
They got very mad at him, right? Why? Well, the point Jesus was making was God's work wasn't done yet. When was God's work done? God's work was done on Holy Saturday. Right? Holy Saturday when Jesus rested in the tomb. That's when God's work was done. Right? And that fulfilled the Sabbath. That was the whole point of the Sabbath, was pointing to that Saturday. Okay? <laughs> that Holy Saturday. Well, this is why we don't worship on Saturday anymore. That was fulfilled. But what happened the day after? Christ rose from the dead. Sunday. Right? Sunday. And put in motion the new creation the first day of the week or the eighth day. This eighth day when the new creation begins. First day of the right. Okay. And so this that's sung at Vespers, this is the Prochemenon that's leading us into that eighth day. And the beginning of that new creation. That's why this is the this is the psalm we're drawn back to on Sunday because Sunday night we're preparing to, every Saturday night we're preparing to celebrate the resurrection that Sunday morning okay. and so we're brought back to this Okay. I think this is probably a good place to stop for tonight we got pretty far, that's what, nine psalms? ten? And you got your unicorn. You got your unicorn. Just kind of hang in there. Okay, so thank you, everybody. It looks like next week we're not going to have Bible study because, uh, try as I might, the only time I could get people together for a Teen teen Soyo kickoff meeting for the year was Sunday night. Sunday? That's been scheduled. Yeah. Yeah, so I'll get with you about doing it one call. But, um, yeah, that's the only time I could find where I could get advisors and... Advisors and teens here, so I'm going to have to cancel. So two weeks from now, we'll come back. And, and believe it or not, the Book of Psalms will be, will be done with it sooner rather than later. I know it seems like a slump. But I think there's a lot of good stuff here. So I think it's like worth it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is where you really get yes. a sense of that. Bible study without end. Amen. But and then and then. Yeah. Then we'll get it. Get into some more. I, I think. 